If you're new to Hope City, your boy always loves to have an anchor verse that ties a bow on the entire weekend. The anchor verse this week is the same as last week for Distracted Faith Part 2. Hebrews 11.1 1 says this. I love the way this reads. The fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, say this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. You know that song, living my best life? It came out of this verse. All right. That's ridiculous. It's our handle. It's our handle on what we can't see. If you're taking down notes, you can write it down. Week four, the final week of Habits and Rabbits, Distracted Faith Part 2 is the title of today's message. Let's pray. God, I thank you that you give us ears to hear you. I pray that if there are anything, if there's anything in our lives that's a distraction, it's putting a lid on our ability to grow. God, we surrender it. We lay it at your feet. And I thank you, God, that every single one of us unanimously in agreement walk out today saying the spirit of the living God was in the room or met me at home while I was watching online. God, be with us. We need a deposit today, a heart ready to receive. If that's you, shout amen. Amen. All right, we're going to jump right in to part two of Distracted Faith with some very specific distractions. If you've been around Hope City, you've probably heard me say this before, but I keep hearing this resounding statement like, I'm just so tired. I'm just so tired. See, I grew up busy. Like, my family was busy, busy. Like, my grandpa's saying was, I'll rest when I'm dead. I'll rest when I'm six feet under. I was like, good Lord. Like, we didn't take vacations. We didn't take siestas, whatever you call them. (laughs) We didn't take breathable moments. We didn't take breaks. Like, you just work hard. And I, listen, I love a hustle. Not to be hustled. And I don't want to hustle anybody. But I love the hustle. I love the grind. Like, I love when people, I know the whole no soliciting signs when somebody knocks on your door. Like, I love seeing people out there getting it done, taking territory. I love that. But there are things in our lives that are distractions. There are things in our lives wearing us out because we're busy doing things that aren't our business. And we're just busy doing things that aren't, it's not connected to our assignment. You're like, I don't understand why I'm so worn out because you've been chasing the wind. There's so many things in our lives that are contending for our attention, get rich quick schemes and all kinds of climb to the top of the pyramid when you step on everybody along the way. And so I want to talk about some distractions because there's some things in our lives that are exhausting us that are not necessary. And we're going to align and prioritize some things and realign our hearts to the heart of God because there are things in our lives that we prioritize that are not connected to God's assignment for our lives. I don't want to get 20 years down the road and be like, I I wasn't supposed to be connected to them, to this, to that, to any of this, because I wasn't listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit. I was listening to tips on social media reels. See, some of y'all maybe have not realized that you have access. Somebody say, I have access. Whether you believe it or not, you have access to the voice of the Holy Spirit. You have, as a daughter and a son, have access to discernment. You have access to the GPS that's built into his word, the moral compass. You're like, well, I just need a, I just need a word. I just need a, a sign. Then, get, then open up that Bible. You need a word from the Lord? Open up your Bible. I heard an advertisement today. I was listening to the news really early this morning. Some of you are like, shouldn't you be praying? You were preaching. I've been praying all week. Amen. <laughs> I was up at 4 a.m. making some coffee, and I turned on the news for just a minute. And uh, th- there was an advertisement. It was really well done. Like, call the psychics of California if you need direction for your life. I mean, it was this whole moment. I said, shut that God out. I started praying in tongues. I said, I'll rebuke that whole thing. <laughs> Stop it. Listen. Some of y'all are messing around with psychics and Ouija boards and tarot cards, and you're trying to get a sign, and you're looking in the wrong place. You're looking in the counterfeit place where the spirit realm is real, but the Holy Spirit will navigate every decision, every step, and put a light on your path. Don't try to mix in the counterfeit with the truth. You know, when Moses was standing with his his staff, the magicians, Pharaoh was showing Moses that my magicians, my, my magi, they can do the same thing as you. So he turned, the Spirit of God turned his staff into a snake and the magicians copied it. There's always something that's counterfeit. 
Some of y'all walking around wearing Yokeleys because they're not Oakleys. There's always a counterfeit. Schnikes. <laughs> There's always a counterfeit. Don't look at the person next to you. Be like, I think he's wearing Schnikes. <laughs> Just busy doing things that aren't connected to our assignment. The phrase rest in the Lord is a frequently used expression in the Bible. David said it this way in Psalms 37, 7. He said, and we love this first part, rest in the Lord. Some of y'all are like, I have permission to sleep in. <laughs> rest in the Lord. This is the part we don't like. And wait patiently for him. You know, patience is one of the fruit of the spirit. How many of y'all could use a little bit more patience? We were leaving a, a, an event last night. My favorite comedian on the planet is a guy named Nate Bargatze. And uh, I took my beautiful wife to the Nate Bargatze uh, show at the NRG Arena last night. And uh, we were exiting and we were going nowhere fast. And I was getting impatient. I was kind of like giving people like the gentle hand of grace. Like, eesh. And we're like, who's pushing me? I'm like, her, the red. Red's got you. We can, all, we can all use a little bit more patience, but here's the truth. Rest in the Lord. When you rest in the Lord, you work from rest, and then you leave the rest up to him. And when you're patient and you trust in his timing, I've said this for years. If you rush it, you'll ruin it. You'll mess things up. You'll rush the timing of God. I remember when I met my beautiful, beautiful girl. I'm telling you, I was at a restaurant the night before. Uh, I, I just told my, my mom, like, everything was all coming together. I had my flight, and I was flying out the next day, and I, I was going to have a trial. I was going to go uh, try out for international basketball. And so I'm about to leave town, and uh, my friends invited me. See, I don't even know about all that. <laughs> Look at the flick of the wrist. Okay. I made eye contact with one guy. He was like, me? I'll play you later. Um, <laughs> So I, I went to this worship night, and the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, you need to go to the altar. You need direction. Everything you've been doing has been in your own timing. Everything you've been doing has been your agenda, your gifts. It's not my plan for your life. Now, we like to pray, God, light up my path. Tell me the way to go. And he's like, I want you to go this way. And like, I don't think so, Lord. That's for somebody else. That's not for me. That's for some So I, I was focused. I was on mission. Goes now to worship. The Lord just wrecks my plans in a good way. I go to this restaurant. My friends were sitting there. I'm telling the guys, I'm going to call my mom. I'm going to tell her I'm not going to leave. Maybe a week or two. Well, on our way out, there are these three girls at this restaurant. And my friend Robin, he thought he was super cool. So he goes over and starts talking. I got all these girls laughing. They're like, ha, ha, you crazy. Except one. This one right here. She was like, boy, I don't have time for silly boys. I'm pre-med. I don't have time for you. And then the one girl goes, weren't you the guy that went down tonight to the altar for addiction? I said, no, it was for direction. I need a direction from the Lord. That's a true story. Why are you telling us this? If I'd have known, if God, now some of y'all have this story. Like, I remember when he walked into the room, there was a light over him. And the Lord said, that will be your Boaz. Like, I know some of you have these stories. The Lord knows me. If he would have let me know at Cheddar's in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that she was going to be, listen to me, y'all, if Cheddar's Ranch is wrong, I don't want to be right. I'll dip cardboard in that. Okay. If the Lord would have told me that she was the one for me, I would have rushed it. I would have ruined it. I would have networked and jockeyed. I would have ended up in one of her classes and her professor's like, can we get security? I don't know why this guy's in here. No, it was a process. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. The Hebrew word translated as rest means to be at peace. Some of y'all need that. Yes. To be still. You know, Exodus 14, 14 says the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. It does not mean lazy. It does not mean weak. It's a posture of saying, God, I can't do this in my own strength. I need you. Yes. To be quiet. Some of y'all are like, that's scriptures from my wife. <laughs> to... Uh, or husband, chatty, chatty, to be quiet or calm. Rest in the Lord is referring, when David's speaking of this, is referring to a, a spiritual rest, a rest from confusion and worry, anxiety and stress. So if you're taking down notes, you want to write this first one down. Y'all, busy isn't working. Busy isn't working. We're just, we're just busy. The worldly way to be still and rest won't fill you up. It's literally, like I said earlier, it's like chasing after the wind, and then there's God's way, where one breath of his spirit can enter the room and 
breakthrough and deliverance and miracles can break out. But if we aren't careful, we end up distracted, dangling carrots. We end up distracted with what the world has to offer. And then we end up clinging to the wrong things. Paul said it so much more eloquently than I can. He said, the spirit is willing, the flesh is weak. And what he was trying to get us to understand is don't be led by your carnality. Don't be led by your flesh. Don't be duped by your emotions. No, no, no. You've got to cling to the presence of God. Because what ends up happening is when we're just busy to be busy and we're just exhausted all the time, we start making excuse after excuse. How many of y'all have ever been, this is a little friendly poll to see how our church is doing. How many of y'all have ever been invited to one of our Hope City groups? Come on, wave at me. Cool, cool, cool. How many of y'all have ever been invited to the Bible study on Tuesdays or the midweek chapel? Y'all are lying. I invite you every week. <laughs> no, no, but we start making excuses like, hey man, you should come to midweek chapel. Oh man. I got, you know, I got so much, I'm, I'm got a lot happening. I'm getting calf implants. You know what I mean? Like I got stuff. <laughs> you ever been on the phone and you just do anything and everything to get off the phone? Some of y'all are like, that's, that's called a Monday through Friday for me. Like where you're like, yeah, oh, yeah, that's cool. Oh, you said group. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Man, I got to go open this bag of chips real quick. I got to go. And they're like, <laughs> what just happened? No, we end up making excuse after excuse because y'all busy, busy isn't working. So I said a couple of weeks ago that we have to find our rhythm. We have to find our cadence to make the most out of the time. That's a gift, by the way, that we've been given on this earth. And pace, your cadence, locking into the rhythm and the timing of God is proof of spiritual maturity. It also unlocks longevity in your life. Now, don't get me wrong. Some of y'all are like, I like this guy. Like he just said, we don't have to work. It's not what I'm saying. You do have to work and take care of your family. You do have to fulfill your responsibilities. David actually wrote in Psalms 90 this. He said, may the favor of the Lord God rest on us. And then it says this, and establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Because the world will say you have to hustle and grind. There's a cultural mentality that says push, constantly run, rest when you're six feet under. But what ends up happening is, I said it a moment ago, we end up just chasing wherever the wind blows, doing things our way instead of God's way. So instead of getting the mind of Christ, we end up going down every rabbit trail that, pre that presents an opportunity. I'm really grateful, to be honest, it's a, a massive learning curve for me. I'm really, really grateful that God didn't reveal our future too quickly. If he had told me what we were gonna be doing, because by the way, July 10th, we celebrate 20 years. The happiest 17 years of my life. Like it's been, they missed that joke. It's been all wonderful, all 20 years. We've been best friends for 22. Thank you. <laughs> best friends for 22. Married almost 20. But if God would have showed me too much, I know my personality. I'm driven, y'all. I would have messed it all up. But this is what the Bible says in Proverbs 16, 9. A man's mind plans his own way. As he journeys through life, by the way, uh, ladies, you're not exempt from this. This is a man, like this is humanity, but as the Lord directs his steps, he will establish them. The Lord will direct our steps. Now we plan our own way as we journey through life, but we have to know and catch this. We have to know what we're called to. We have to know the timing. We have to know when we're called to work and when we're called to rest, because if you aren't rested, you won't be ready. I feel that consistently. If you're not rested and you're not working from a spirit of rest, then you won't be ready for what God has for you, for what God is wanting to unlock through you. I was in uh, Arkansas. Make some noise if you're from Arkansas. Exactly. <laughs> I knew it. I did almost get beat up, Jack, in between services. This lady said, this is my first time here, and I'm from Arkansas. It was the last service, and I said, Praise God, she said. I said, I, I never joke about Arkansas. And she's like, well, hopefully this is the last time you do. And she was like, she walked off. I was like, I'll see you next week, maybe. All right. So I was in Arkansas, and a mentor, a pastor friend of mine, 
We're sitting at lunch, and he said, man, how's the church doing? Looks like it's doing phenomenal. I started giving him the metrics of salvations and baptisms and just what God has been doing, the fruit that we're seeing. And he said, well, how's Jackie? I told him, he said, how's your kids? I said, they're doing phenomenal. My son's 15, got a little pencil mustache. It's amazing. And Finn's 13, Daphne's seven. My little fox is about to turn five. He said, great. And then he asked this question, and it was like a riddle. He goes, so what's your toes in the mud? I said, What? He said, toes in the mud. And I'm like looking under the table. I was like, I'm not following. Like, it's Arkansas. I don't know what they're saying. It's all riddles. And He said, toes in the mud. He goes, all right, I'm setting you up. Let me, let me, let me explain this. It's going to help somebody. He said, a little, it's a true story of a 10-year-old boy. Every time it rained, every time it rained, he was glued to the window looking outside wanting to play. And his mom would say, don't even think about it. You're not going outside because you're going to get all muddy. And he'd say, oh, okay. And he'd watch the rain and only child and he'd get distracted and then he'd go play and then come back. Dad comes home about a month later. Dad yells, hey, 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 don't even think about going outside. Well, you'll get all muddy. You're not going outside. And they watched him leaned up on his knees on the couch, just looking out the window, just watching it. And the mom said, hey, let him go play. So he said, hey, you want to go play? And he said, ah, for real? They said, yeah. Takes his shoes and socks off, and as he's running out the door, they said, but don't get in the mud. Before they could say mud, he ran out. And what did he do? He ran directly to the mud and dug his toes in the mud. All the Some of you are like, that's disgusting. And the mom and dad both looked at each other, and they said they had never seen so much peace and joy on their little boy's face. And she said, hey, Let's go join him. He said, but don't go in the mud. And she was out the door. And they all ran outside and dug their toes in the mud. Why are you telling us this story? How's this spiritual? This pastor looked at me and he goes, what's your toes in the mud? What is the thing that causes you to take a deep breath and decompress? Rest in the Lord? Refresh? Some of y'all say, well, that's golf. And not me. I get angry and it costs too much. If it's fishing, for me, I like to roll the windows down in my Jeep, get a cup of coffee, no music on, just drive with the wind blowing. I was going to say through my hair. That's just prophesying. <laughs> Sometimes I'll put a wig on, and then I'll just wind through my beard. Thanks, babe. Yeah, great. So, but th there's, what is your toes in the mud? Sometimes I'll sit down, and another toes in the mud moment, I like to color with my, my littles. I'll just color with Daphne, flip my phone over. What's your toes in the mud? He said, I need you to identify five things, five toes in the mud moments that you could say, I apply these to my life and I rest. That's a word for somebody. Because some of you are like, well, you know, it's that one. Okay, that, about that. Let me think about, no, no, I want you to write that down. What are my toes in the mud moments? How do I learn to slow down, prioritize my time with Jesus, and rest in the Lord and work from rest. Because when we leave the rest up to him, he in return gives us discernment. He in return gives us direction. He in return blesses us like Deuteronomy 28, 8 says and says that everything we put our hands to will be blessed. I don't want to just be busy doing busy work, idle time like a hamster wheel, rabbit trails and figure eight patterns. I want to be smack dab in the middle of God's perfect will. Come on, somebody say Amen. Story of two sisters, Martha and Mary, not Jesus's uh, mother Mary, but another Mary, the other Mary that the Bible refers to. And you're going to see in Luke chapter 10 where Martha was just working. She was busy and distracted, working for God, not even recognizing the presence of Jesus was in the room where Mary was sitting at his feet. It's interesting how in our humanity we can at the exact same time of walking through a storm, not recognize that Jesus is in the boat with us. He's with you in the middle of that diagnosis being read, the diagnosis being read. He's with you in the middle of that, that fight and that argument where the spouse or your spouse says, maybe we should throw in the towel. The presence of God is always with you. He's in the boat. The Holy Spirit does not take a smoke break and go outside and say, I ain't dealing with this. Y'all argue on your own. I'll come back. No, no, he's always present. Martha didn't recognize. Sure, Jesus was in the room. She didn't recognize the 
essential foundational need to just sit at his feet. Watch this now. While they were on their way, Luke 10, 38 through 42, Jesus entered a village called Bethany and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She is the hostess with the mostest. She had a sister named Mary who seated herself at the Lord's feet. She was listening to his teaching. But Martha was very busy and very distracted. That's what we're talking about with Habits and Rabbits with all of her serving and responsibilities, she approached him and said, Lord, is it of no concern to you that my sister has left me to do the serving alone? This little section here is what Brecken says to Jackie and I every day about Finley. Finley, there you are. <laughs> Why am I having to do all this on my own? By the way, Finley does a lot. Hey. She says, tell her to help me. Tell her to do her part. But the Lord replied, Martha, Martha, you're so worried and bothered and anxious about so many things. I hope that you're reading between this a little bit and seeing that the only thing necessary was that Mary had chosen to sit at his feet. Y'all were so busy. When's the last time you got up a little earlier and prayed? When's the last time you got up early and just sat and sat in quiet and said, speak to me, Lord, I'm listening. When's the last time you've just turned on some worship and got on your knees before God and said, Lord, all the other distractions in my life matter not because I need to spend time with you. When's the last time you've silenced this, turned it all the way down or turned it off and put it in a drawer and said, God, I'm not moving until you move on my behalf. When's the last time you've recognized the king is in the room because something is sitting on the throne of your heart. It's either the king of kings and the Lord of lords or it's distractions. So we shouldn't just be busy, just being busy. I don't have time for that. I don't, I can't prioritize that pastor Daniel. Now you have to be intentional about slowing down enough to spend time in his presence. The more seasoned I'm getting in life, which means I'm getting older. <laughs> I like my people say that the more seasoned I am. You're like, sir, you're just getting older. Okay. <laughs> I've realized the importance of prioritizing rest. I do. I remember my mom used to, it was a little bit of a threat. She's like, boy, you made that bed. Now you need to lay in it. Now at this point, I'm like, well, I like a nap. I'll take a nap. You don't threaten that. I'm going to go to sleep. Amen. All right. So number one, busy isn't working. Number two, write this down. It's another major distraction. And this one's tough to tackle. Pride isn't productive. We'll talk about pride and ego for a minute. I had written in my notes, pride isn't pretty, but pride isn't productive. Now, I've never struggled with this. I'm a very humble guy, so I'm just going to talk to you guys. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I remember sophomore year of high school, sophomore year of high school, uh, I was being recruited by quite a few colleges, and uh, every scouting report was literally almost like they had been talking. The scouting reports kept coming back. He can, he's ambidextrous. He can dribble with both hands. He can shoot with either hand. He has good handles. He has great court awareness. He has great basketball EQ. And this was the sticky statement that was on every scouting report. This player is not coachable. I'm like, yes, I am. Sophomore year, I had been running my own play, literally not listening to the coaches. We're down by six and a half to a team that we should have been up on. The coach walked in, said nothing, pulled out the dry erase board and wrote down a word, one word, and said, this right here spells Dan. You got to know me well to call me Dan. He said, this right here spells Dan. And I'm like, E-G-O? No, it didn't. And the team's like, oh, snap. Ego. He said, we're all in Dan's world. He's the only one on the court. It was a wake up call moment. And then he said, there is no I in team. I'm like, but there is in win. Amen. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I got benched the rest of that game. At some, now maybe not my Daphne. I, I don't even know if she has sin nature. She's just the sweetest ever. But at the core of all of us, we all struggle with pride. A little bit. How many of y'all have struggled with pride before? Come on. Some of y'all are like, I'm not lifting my hand. My pride won't allow me. Y'all, the truth is pride isn't productive. I love this quote. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's a there you are, not here am I mentality. Because we all, we, all, we all want that access. We all love that walk into a room and people know your name. 
No, but the truth is when you walk into a room, it shouldn't be here I am, it should be there you are. It's, it's thinking of others and thinking of yourself less. This is what the Bible says about it, Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And Luke 10, it talks about how Satan's pride led to his fall and then his perpetual issues continued on and the delusion of it continued on and it brought man to their fall as well. Pride affects everyone. It affects those around us, those who love us the most, and it also leaves us missing out on the presence of God. Pride leaves you delusional, believing that every, account, every accomplishment, all your personal victories and accolades are all because of you, but every failure is the fault of someone else. Because you have a me, myself, and I sort of complex, pride will convince you that you don't need community. If you struggle with this, today's a great day to lay that down. And if I'm stepping on your toes, some of you are like, man, I, hope, I wish he'd move on to something else. <laughs> no, I've dealt with this so I can preach out of a process of restoration. Pride will convince you that you don't need community. I don't need a small group. Others need that. I don't need freedom. Other people need to be free. But community doesn't need you because you're God's gift to that community. Now, you need community because Proverbs 27, 17 is a big deal that iron sharpen iron. We have to sharpen each other. But if you deny that, you'll miss out on the gift of brothers and sisters. You'll miss out on the gift of relationships and friends and family. It silences the voices of wisdom in your life because pride will have you believing you're the ultimate source of knowledge. Have you ever heard the saying before, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room? I want to be a big sponge. I want to soak up and listen and glean and learn from those who have gone before me. Young people, do not disrespect and dismiss those who have gone before you. And older folks, seasoned veterans, don't dismiss the energy and the creativity of the younger generation. We can all work together. I'm preaching better than you're responding. I don't know. The other thing pride does is it robs you of servanthood. You know, statistically, when you serve others, it deflates pride in your life. I'm going to give you some practical steps to overcome pride. It's going to help somebody start checking your motives. Now, let me just clear something up because I got almost destroyed online about it. I was like, check yourself before you wreck yourself. And I said it was MC Hammer. I apologize. It was Ice Cube. Okay. Am I right? Okay. All you Toby Mac fans are like, we don't know. All right. It's ridiculous. We have to start checking our motives. Check your prideful thoughts and your behaviors so you can maintain a, a humble heart. A humble heart will open up doors. Pride will slam doors closed, and then you're wondering, how come I'm not getting ahead? I said it a moment ago, but when you engage in serving, when you serve, this is another practical step. When you show up and you say, I'm going to think of others before myself. I'm going to have a there you are, not here in my mentality. It actually deflates pride and ego in your life. And you're like, I'm going to help others and value others. Here's another way to dismantle pride in your life. Focus on areas that you're grateful in. I say this almost every day. Jesus, if you never did anything else but hang on the cross for me, it would have been enough. But you've been better than good to me. You just keep on protecting and providing and showing up and fighting for me. So how many areas of your life can you just lift your hands and say, I'm just so grateful in the it turns the, it's is all of me, and it says, no, John chapter 3, verse 30, no, you have to increase, and I have to decrease. Another one I've been preaching about this a lot is we have to seek accountability. You have to maintain close relationships with people that are going to give you not only feedback, but ready for this, honest feedback. Hey, you're getting a little cocky. No, it's confidence, bro. No, no, it's just cockiness. You have to have people in your life that can pop that pride and ego bubble so that you can continue to grow. I'm going to move on to another one because some of y'all are like, I'm not listening to this anymore. Okay, great. <laughs> this last one I feel like some folks are going to get set free from because this is an area that I have wrestled with and it is in the lineage of my family. Number three, I want to talk about fear for a minute. Fear is a distraction of faith that will rob you of your faith. I say this all the time that fear tolerated is faith contaminated. Fear tolerated, you may want to take a picture of that. 
Is faith contaminated? If I had the most crystal clear, quadruple re reverse osmosis water, like, oh, this is so, this is amazing. Like, if I took red 40 food coloring and I just barely put the tip of a, uh, of a toothpick in it and put it in that water, it would contaminate, it would change, it would alter it. Fear tolerated is faith contaminated. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love a sound mind. The enemy has one agenda, to steal, to kill, and destroy. That's John chapter 10, verse 10. But the Lord, he comes to rescue, to redeem, to restore. And I also need you to recognize that you're worth fighting for. You're that valuable, that he loves you so much that you don't have to be bound by fear and timidity and anxiety and depression, because the enemy wants us consumed. We know that fear is a result of human nature, but specifically, it's a lack of understanding the goodness of God. Because 1 John 4, 18 says that, the, that his perfect love casts out all fear. And God has never been and never will be the author of fear. He's the author of peace. He's the giver of hope. He'll unlock freedom in your life. Jeremiah 29, 11 is a prophecy that he has a great future for us filled with good things, not without struggle, but a future filled with his promises of freedom and because ultimately he has his hand on our lives. But it's easy to lose track of this when you get distracted by the lies of the enemy. I'm gonna to try to tell this story kind of abbreviated, but I remember I was on a preaching assignment. I was flying to, um, I believe it was, ah, shoot, I can't remember what state it was, but they had to reroute, uh, they had to reroute the trip through Atlanta, which how, how many of y'all fly? How many of y'all have ever gotten stuck in Atlanta? Oh, dear Lord. Anyways, we're stuck in Atlanta. And so, so but as we're flying, the, the pilot comes on and says, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're about to experience some, some major turbulence. I mean, Y'all, the turbulence was crazy. The little oxygen bags, they, got that, they fell out and panic. I mean, like panic went all throughout the plane. Like you get people were trying to grab them and you didn't even need them. It just was nuts. And then the pilot comes on and says, I don't want anybody to be afraid. We're low enough. We're about to bring this in for a landing, but we have lost the right engine. I'm on the right side of the plane. And I'm looking at this engine, and he's like, I'm done, I'm out. Like, and we're coming in a little crooked, and we land this plane, and I'm telling you, people got off, people were throwing up, people got up and were kissing the ground. I was like, I wouldn't do that. But I understood why, you know what I mean? So I walked by, I called Jackie Mila, I'm like, baby, I, we could have died today. The oxygen baggies fell, the engine that's smoking, and it stopped working. She's like, calm down, take a breath. She's like, okay, well, so what's the plan? I said, oh, I'm renting a car. I got a car reserved at Enterprise. She's like, how far of a drive is that? I was like, 18 hours. She's like, when are you preaching? I said, 19 hours. <laughs> I need some carrot sticks, hot tamales, and some bucky nuts. I'm going. Like beaver nuggets, I'm getting there. You know what I mean? Like, I'm just going to crunch, crunch, and just get there. And she's like, hey, listen, hey. You need to get on the next flight. Y'all, I'm telling you, fear was trying to grip me. I don't wrestle with this, but I was like, I'm never flying again. The devil's a liar. Tried to take me out once. Not going to do it again. They rebooked me on another flight. People are like, I'm not flying. I'm not flying. I'm like, I'll jump in with you. Like, we'll drive. Run one of them party buses. We'll just drive. You know what I mean? And I remember they were like, last call, last boarding. And I remember standing there pacing back and forth. And I walk up to where the jet bridge door opens. And I felt so gripped by fear. Have you ever felt so gripped by fear? I'm just, this is a transparent moment here. So you're like, I thought you were a preacher. Look, this is a while back. Amen. I've overcome. <laughs> and I remember I was standing at the threshold and I felt like the Lord said, if you don't take this step and you don't resist the spirit of fear, it will not only rob you of your assignment, but all the people connected to your purpose. So I took a step back and I stepped in and I began to pray all the way down. And listen, if you're not spirit-filled and you don't pray in tongues, that's a good time to do so. I was like, yes, I got that about. I was praying. I needed an organ player. Like I was, and then I get on this plane, true story, and it is hot. The air is not working. I'm like, great, this is another defective plane. I'm sitting on this plane, and this dear brother next to me is like, I'm like, yeah, it's real hot. And I was trying to tell him we lost the engine, the last plane. And y'all, when it's hot like that, it, it, it empowers plane drama. And I love some plane drama. Like, 
I just do. I'm here for it. I'm like, oh, she's getting crazy. Like, I love some plane drama. So anyways, I'm sitting there. They finally take off. The air finally turns on. And I'm like, it's time for me to just rest in the Lord. My heart had been running like 220 beats per minute this entire time. So I'm like, the guy's like, she's talking to me. I was like, yeah, okay, great. My <laughs> AirPods in. And I, I, I look over and he's like, what is it? Oh, yeah. I don't know how old the plane is. You're right. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. this Branson? Yeah, it's beautiful this time of year. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Okay, yeah, right. Okay, great. All right. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> For like 10 minutes. I'm like, bro, I need a break. And then he says this. He says, hey, I, I hope you don't mind me eating this. And he holds up this like jumbo to go back. And I was like, man, I almost died on the previous flight. <laughs> We're in a free country. Eat whatever you want. He's like, well, I've got extra. I said, no, I'm good. Praise God. <laughs> All right. True story. I'm not making this up. I wake up to croissant, flaky croissant, bloating in the atmosphere. This guy is going in on this sandwich. I mean, he's just, rah, like he's in a man versus food contest. It's everywhere. Not only is it all over him and in the atmosphere, y'all, it's all over me. I'm like, what is happening? And I hadn't eaten. I had pesto mayo on my lip. I don't know how. He was violent with that sandwich. It's just like, oh, this is unbelievable. Now I'm frustrated. The humanity side, I've almost died. My wife talked me into the assignment. It's hot. It's Houston hot. And now I got pesto mayo on my lip. I don't know this guy. And he's like, oh, you got some on? He's brushing me off. I'm like, so that's assault. Don't touch me. So now I'm like, you've woken me up. Watch this. Watch this. Some of you are like, how are you going to tie this back to spiritual? If I would have let fear rob me of my assignment, if I would have let fear rob me of my step, I said, man, what's your story? And this guy begins to tell me, and I'm flying. So where are you going? He said, anywhere but home. I said, yeah. He said, I found out my wife's been cheating on me. And I was like, oh, man. And he starts telling me his journey, his story, and I've been consumed by work. I've just been so busy. And I realized in this moment, everything that led to this moment, this domino effect, was for me to be sitting next to him. I said, well, man, let me tell you about some promises. Promises that never fail when people do. Promises that don't break when you lean on them. I'm sitting in this row with croissant and pesto mayo all over me, <laughs> praying for a man I do not know, leading him to the Lord again, praying restoration and healing, exchanging information. You know, he stayed up to date with me. He went back, went to counseling. His wife and him decided to go through a restorative process. They stayed together. God began to breathe and heal and all the areas that had been broken. What if, what if I had to refuse to take a step? Can't save them all. Like the little girl who threw the starfish back into the ocean when the guy said, why are you wasting your time? You can't save them all. And she said, but I can, I can save this one. I'm grateful for spirit-led moments. I'm grateful that you talked me in to going on that flight. Man, and he's right here. He's actually over. He's not here. I wish he was. That would have made this moment so much better. Good Lord. If he was like, that's me, it would have been with a sandwich in his hand. I'm like, you can't script that better. That would be phenomenal. Let's see if we can get him here for the next two services. Close your eyes with me if you don't mind. Maybe you've been busy. It's just not working. Maybe you've been so consumed in life that you haven't felt the Spirit of God lately. Maybe you have been so consumed by pride and arrogance and ego that you've made God in your life you. Maybe you've fallen away. Maybe you got caught up in the prodigal life. Maybe you veered off course and throughout this series, Habits and Rabbits, you've gone down some rabbit trails that maybe you have felt like have been putting a lid on your faith. Maybe you're here and you've been consumed by fear. 
You know, here at Hope City, I can say this with all confidence. We're not chasing after miracles. We're chasing after the miracle worker. And the presence of the Almighty God can fix, heal, restore, and break off shackles of fear, anxiety, brokenness. And I believe he wants to do a restorative work as we bring this weekend into a close. If you're here and you would say, Pastor Daniel, I, I connect with this word today. I needed this word today. I feel like I have been the cause of holding me back. Or maybe it's been fear that's been holding me back or pride that's been holding me back across every campus. If you connected and you said, I want to be set free this week, would you just lift up your hand? I'm looking all over. I see you. I see you. This isn't a salvation moment. This is, I just want to get free from all of this. Beautiful. I'm going to have the team go back into this song and, and, and I want you with great expectation to get ready to receive a fresh wind behind your sail. Hope like you have an experience in a reigniting of your faith that's necessary to step into everything that God has for us. Would you stand your feet across every campus, additional seating, watching online, join us. Come on, Kim, let's jump in. Slip your hands because another one is on the way. Miracles, signs, wonders, breakthrough, deliverance, healing, restoration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because another one is. Come on, one more time, give him praise. Come on, if you received, just cast that care on the Lord today. I love it, I love it. With every eye closed just for a moment, two opportunities, and then we're going to get out of here. And you can beat the Presbyterians to Applebee's. Amen. If you're here today, two opportunities. Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10 says, Confess with your mouth. Believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and you will be saved. This is the first invitation. Pastor Daniel, I don't know Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. And I needed this word because the truth is I've just been in survival mode. 
Here at Hope City, we don't believe that all gods lead back to one God. We believe, according to Romans 10, verse 9 and 10, that when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we'll not only be saved, but Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life to the Father. And all this costs you is surrender. Jesus already paid the tab in full on Calvary for you because he said you were worth it. Second invitation is this. Pastor Daniel, busy isn't working. That's all I've been. Pride and ego, oh yeah, that's me. Fear, being consumed by anxiety, not being good enough. All of it has taken me down a path or a rabbit trail and I've disconnected from my relationship with Jesus. And today I wanna rededicate my life to him. I wanna make everything right with him on April 28th at 11.53 a.m. I wanna make everything right with him today. If you're at Woodlands, I want you to get ready to lift up your hand. One of those two invitations, Katie. Additional seating here at West Houston. When I hit three, I want you to boldly say, I fit one of those two invitations. I want to give my life to Jesus for the first time. One, I want to rededicate my life. Two, if you're watching online, you can say yes to Jesus. Our team will help you across every campus. Three, if you connect with either one of those invitations, slip up your hand. I'm looking all over. I see you and you and you and you and you and you and you. I see you and you. I see you. I saw you. I see you and you. I see you, my friend. I see you in the back. All the way in the back. Yeah, I see you. I see you. Over here. Over there. Come on, Hope City. Can we give God praise? That's a lot of hands. Wow. All right, we're all going to pray this prayer. So to our 30 friends or so who just lifted up their hand, they won't feel uncomfortable. Can everybody pray this prayer out loud? Say, Jesus, here I am, surrendering everything. All my sin, all my shame, all my bad choices. I'm asking for your forgiveness. Thank you for redeeming me, restoring me, and healing me. Jesus, thank you for hanging on that cross, swapping out your life for mine so that I can live a life filled with freedom. From this moment on, I'm choosing to walk with you. You're my Father. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name. Come on, Hope City. Give God praise because heaven's rejoicing with us.